Good evening, everyone. Good to see you here this evening. The opening hymn this evening is very appropriate because it's a happy day. And of course, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, what a happy day. It doesn't necessarily mean everything goes smooth sailing. As I said one night before, uh, sometimes our salvation and life in Christ is a bit like a bed of roses. Have you ever fallen into a bed of roses? Can we cast thorny? But it's still sweet, and it's good to believe and to know the Saviour. So let's stand and sing 276 and praise him, but it'll be in the overhead. O happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Saviour and my God. good singing. Let's just bow in the Lord's presence and a word of prayer, please. Father, we thank you tonight that we can come into your presence in the wonderful and precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, of him whom we've been singing about who washed our sins away. And Lord, we thank you that most of us here, if not all, can 
praise you for so great salvation. And Lord, whether in the building tonight or listening online or for those that don't know Christ as Savior, we pray, Lord, that tonight might be the night that they'll know that experience of having their sins washed away. Father, we thank you that Christ on the cross bore the sins, not just our sins, and paid the debt, but not only for us, but for the whole world. And there's no one who's going to go to a Christless hell because of their sin. They're going to go to Christless hell if they reject the Savior. And so we just pray tonight that men and women and young people might be conscious of eternity and the reality that they must accept your offer of salvation or forever be damned in a Christless hell. Lord, we realize it's not your will. Your word assures us that your long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray tonight that as the word of God goes forth in song, as it goes forth in the preached word, that God the Holy Spirit would work mightily. And that as a result of it tonight, that sinners might trust the Savior. Father, we, many of us here can look back to that hour when we trusted the Savior ourselves, realizing that we were sinners in the sight of a holy God, that there was nothing that we could do, no work of righteousness that would ever commend us to you, for all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in your sight. All we could do is to come and trust the Savior, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, the old chorus got it right, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. It's nothing we did, it's what he has done for us. And so we come and rejoice in him tonight. Thank you for that precious blood that cleanses and keeps on cleansing us from sin. And so far, undertake for the preaching of the word tonight, the singing of the gospel. And we pray, Father, not only for here, but everywhere up and down this land, throughout the world indeed tonight, where the word of God has and is and will go forth, glorify your thrice holy name. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, it's good to see you, you along, but it's also good to see your brother Gordon back with us some time since he was here. But we're just going to ask our brother Gordon Quinn to come and bring his first couple of pieces in song. And we thank him for traveling the, the long way from Enniskill. I think Gordon probably traveled the furthest distance tonight, but he's, he may well have been first here as well. <laughs> good to see you, brother. Come on. Oh my 
place far away On a green rugged hill Where the Savior did yield To his dear Father's will For the sins of the world Is life's blood My friend, won't you trust him? Find him to be that wonderful savior of the list shall be. There's a place in the sky. Christ is gone to prepare If you know Him as Savior Then we'll meet over there So give Him your all And you surely shall see Why I love my dear man Amen, and good to see you, and I thank you for coming as well, even though I was here, you still come. Amen. You were just thinking there, as I was singing, it's funny the things you think of when you're singing, but <clears throat> um, it's possible to miss what God is for you. When I look back in my life, I was only a young boy, hadn't an understanding of the gospel, but there came a man from England and he had a wee gospel mission up the road from us and I've never been able to trace anything about him since and that's about 60 years ago. He had a wee mission up the road from us and we had no car. Um, a neighbour man brought us to the meetings. And there was one night in that meeting, as a young boy, that I thought it applied to me. That was the first time I'd ever remember thinking anything about the gospel. And that one meeting, I sought the Lord. But you know, friends, I often think I could have missed it if I hadn't gone to that mission, if that man hadn't come from England, well, it could have been somebody else, but I just often think of dear people and friends of mine that have known over the years and people that have been brought up in gospel meetings and still have never trusted the Lord. 
Isn't it a strange thing? Strange thing. People who have sat under the gospel for years, and God gave me the grace in that one meeting when I understood that I needed to trust him that he did it. The Lord has guided me. Made many mistakes in the life, but the Lord has guided me. And you know, friends, your life is the sum total, really, of the decisions that you've made. You've made decisions, some you, you, you regret. See, a whole lot of men and women sitting together here. You've made a whole lot of decisions that you didn't regret. But you know, friends, we make decisions in life. And we can make a decision in this life that has consequences right through into the next life. That's the big one. And if you haven't yet made that decision to trust Jesus Christ, I, I just pray that you will. Put your trust in him. Hand your life over to him. He knows better how to run it than you do. This life is a journey in search of a land. The pathway so often is not as we plan. But with Jesus beside us, we surely Just look for the touch of the Master's strong hand. And I feel the touch of the Master's strong hand. Leading me on through this weary Thank you, Gordon, for those two pieces of song, and we'll hear you shortly again in a few moments' time. But a few announcements, please. I know it's always the most interesting part of the meeting, not. But do remember them. Do remember Wednesday evening, our midweek meeting 
is in the form of a missionary meeting. Lace Thomas will be along from Shelter Now UK, and do remember that and pray much for it, and please come along. Then next Sunday, Joshua Glendini will be responsible for the services morning and evening from Cook. And then the evening, Rachel and Leah, who are his sisters, we heard this morning, uh, will be along to sing in the evening as well. Now, that's the 22nd. The 29th, which is the following week, is our harvest services. And Pastor Ian Wilson will be along that night or that day. So do remember those services as well. Now, we are also planning to start an after-schools children's club. And if you would like to help in any way, we, we do ask you to pray for it. But if you can help in any way, either speak to Russell or to Elizabeth about that, please. Then, this is also the CEF week of prayer. So do remember that. And again, I think Jennifer brought along the booklets tonight. I mentioned she was going to bring the prayer booklets if you haven't already got one this morning, but she, not, Jennifer wouldn't forget. I just announced it too early, isn't that right? But anyway, they're there at the back for you. If you haven't got some, please pick those up. And there's also a, we'll send out notices and if you don't get one, every day we'll try and send out notices and apology if you get some duplicates of prayer requests for the, each day. So there's a number of prayer requests that go out each day and we'll forward those as Jennifer sends those out. Uh, then on the Samaritan's Purse collection for uh, boxes there for the Christmas will be, from, be finished off for the 13th to the 20th of November. So if you participate in that, please make sure you have those ready, uh, either a gift or some boxes the week of the 13th to the 20th of November. Also, referring back to CEF, the fellowship meal for CEF this year is on the 21st of November. And again, if you want to attend that, please see Jennifer or Fred Mina or myself, and we'll make sure you get a virtual ticket. Uh, We don't actually give out tickets, but we uh, take names and you give us the money. Uh, Do remember that and pray much for it. Now, finally, we're changing our Facebook page. Now, if you're not on Facebook for the church, uh, it is being changed. Now, don't ask me to explain it because I couldn't. I don't understand it other than our brother Brian is changing it over to a different Facebook, the same name. But there's a link in the Facebook page. If you go down and click on it, it'll automatically do the changeover for you, I'm told. I will also circulate that link around the prayer line so that That may or may not help you, Uh, but the Facebook is being changed over. Uh, It'll still be under the same name, but it it will be different. Now, I used to have a fellow who worked with him. He used to say, now I've told you more than I know, and that's exactly where I am at the minute about Facebook. (laughs) I've told you more than I know. Anyway, thankfully our brother who sings, knows the Saviour, and our brother David Cosby, who's going to preach for us, knows the Saviour, and they know what they're talking about, and singing about, and preaching about. We may know not about Facebook, but we know about the Lord and his word. So, brother, would you come and sing your little piece, please?
I hear the blessed Savior call How can I make a lesser sacrifice When Jesus gave his all I cried, Lord Jesus, and he spoke my name I saw his hands all bruised and cold I stood to kiss away the marks of shame That shame for me that he had borne Take up thy cross and fall Blessed Savior call How can I make A lesser sacrifice When Jesus gave his all I crawl Till the crown appears The way I journey soon will end Then God himself will wipe away all tears And friend all fellowship with friends Blessed Savior call How can I make a lesser sacrifice When Jesus gave his own How can I make a lesser sacrifice when Jesus gave his own. Thank you very much, Gordon. We really appreciate not only coming, but your songs as well. And praise to the Lord. I, of course, forgot to welcome his wife, and could just very welcome as well tonight. Now, we enjoyed the word of the Lord through our brother David Cosby this morning. It was a challenge, but it was also full of good teaching for us, and we thank you very much, brother, and we just look forward to hearing you preach the gospel this evening. Now, before David comes to preach the gospel, we're going to sing... There is a name I love to hear. It's 356 and praise him, or it will be in the overhead, please. We'll stand to sing. And while you're, just before the musicians, because it used to be somebody who say, you forgot an announcement. You know, you get a text nowadays to tell you. As part of the week of prayer at CF, and we'd send this around the, uh, the prayer line, but on Saturday morning, there's a time of prayer in Rich Hill Baptist in Londonderry, but also in First Limavady Church Hall, kindly granted here this morning, uh, in Saturday morning. But we'll send you the details of that around the text in the prayer line as well. But do remember the week of prayer as well as the gallery on Saturday morning. There is a name I love to hear. <coughs>
Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you again this evening. Thank you so much for being here. And I'll just echo Gordon's words as well, even though I'm here. <laughs> it's great to see you all here. Thank you so much for coming this evening. And thank you again for the welcome. Good to renew fellowship again with our brother and sister in Christ here. And good to see them again as well. Thank you so much for ministering this evening. Now, we're turning in God's Word tonight, please, to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, we're going to begin at verse 1. And really, Mark chapter 13 is the parallel passage to Matthew chapter 24. And if you're familiar with Matthew's gospel, Matthew 24 is that chapter where the Lord speaks about things that are going to happen in the future and uh, gives warnings and gives signs of things that they could expect to see in the last days. And we very much are living in that time today. So we're going to look at this parallel passage in Mark chapter 13. I'm beginning at verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be. But the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. And there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrow. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost." Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son. And children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Just before we read any more, just pay attention to that last verse. It's got nothing to do with enduring for salvation. It's to do with enduring to be redeemed and to be saved out of a time of trouble. It's not in relation to our salvation from sin. It's our salvation from trouble. And especially for those that will be here during the tribulation period. But let's jump down into verse 21, please. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed. Behold, I have foretold you all things. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. And I learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Amen. 
We are probably living in the most exciting time since the days of biblical revelation. By biblical revelation, I mean that time when miracles were a more common occurrence, when new knowledge was being received from God, when God was giving out signs and wonders on the earth for people to pay attention to. We're talking about the time when the Bible was being disseminated to mankind through inspiration of the Holy Spirit to about 40 different authors over a period of about 1,600 years and gives us the Bible that we have today. The Bible is filled with prophetic writings, but there have also been periods when some of those writings have been fulfilled. I say some because there are some that are yet to be fulfilled. Not that some weren't fulfilled, but just, just haven't yet been fulfilled. There was the period of exile. Whenever the children of Israel and the children of Judah were taken into captivity, there were prophecies given concerning that exile. And Daniel knew from the book of Jeremiah, for example, that the, Judah, that the people of Judah would be in Babylon for a period of 70 years before they would be released and sent back to their land. There's the period of empires. If you look at uh, Daniel chapter uh, 7 and Daniel chapter, uh, I, think it's three, I think it's 4, if I remember correctly, I might be wrong on that. But about Nebuchadnezzar and the statue that he had in his dream. I think it might be actually chapter 2. But anyway, Daniel uh, chapter 2 where, he, where Nebuchadnezzar had the vision of the, of the image of gold and silver and brass and iron and iron and clay. And how it was destroyed by a rock that came out of a mountain but not carved by hands. That's a picture of the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greek, the Roman Empire, and then the empire of the Antichrist. When we come to chapter 7, it may mean something slightly different. I'll not get into it now, but you can ask me about it later if you want. But again, it's talking about different empires, different national alliances or international alliances that come together. And so we have these period of empires being fulfilled. We have the period of entrance where God entered into his creation through the Lord Jesus Christ prophesied hundreds of years beforehand. For example, in, in Isaiah chapter 7, the virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and he shall be called Emmanuel. 700 years before the Lord Jesus came. And there are 300 to 600 prophecies concerning just the Lord Jesus' first entrance into the world at his first advent and every single one of them was fulfilled. And then there's the period of the end. End times, the last days, and, the, and this passage that we're looking at here is referring to that period of time, the time we're living in just now. This passage refers to the time after, mostly, the rapture of the church. But it also gives us signs, hints of when that's going to be. Signs that we should look out for of that time approaching. So the passage isn't dealing with now specifically, but dealing with the time immediately after this when the tribulation comes, but it's giving us, given as a sign and as a warning and a clarion call to those that are alive also during this church age. Like uh, before a thunderstorm, you can sense a change in the air before the thunder and the lightning start. The clouds are gathering, there's a change in pressure uh, in the air, there can, there's a change in the animal noises and in their behavior. You can sense that the storm is coming. And that's exactly the time that we're living in now, this time before the storm. And I want us to see this evening five signs that time is running out. Now, why do I call it that? Well, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're told of what will happen concerning the revelation of the Antichrist when he will be revealed. We're told that the, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit through the church is a restraining influence on evil. The word let here means restrain. And the Holy Spirit will continue to restrain evil until he be taken out of the way, not removed from the world, but the blockage is removed. The church is taken out of the way. We're taken up to be with the Lord forever in heaven. And we're told that the restraining work of the Holy Spirit is removed. And it says, and then shall that wicked or that wicked one be revealed. 
whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And it says in verse 11, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What is this talking about? This is talking about those who hear the gospel of Jesus Christ now In this period of time, before the rapture of the church, before all the believers disappear in one single moment. And if you hear the gospel in this period of time and reject it, you will not have a second opportunity to be saved. You may be here for the duration of the seven years of tribulation. But the Bible tells us that God will send those people strong delusion. That they will believe the lie of the Antichrist so that they will not be saved. Time is running out for those who are hearing the gospel today. And I want to give you those five signs. First of all, I want you to see that there's counterfeit religion. In verses 5 and 6, Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. The Lord speaks about that same sort of thing in verses 21 and 22. If any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. There is a massive rise in counterfeit religion. In the year 1500, there were 10 major religions in the world. In 2023, there are about 40 major religions in the world. And it's suggested that today there are approximately 10,000 minor religions in the world. Now that all leads to confusion. Because people start wondering then, well, which is the right religion? Which is the right faith to believe in? It also leads to deceptions, this thing called syncretism, which is just that every religion will eventually lead to God. And that all you need to do is to be sincere. But the Bible tells us there is only one way to God, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. And that God the Father will receive all who come unto him through the Lord Jesus Christ. But all of these religions are designed by Satan to sow confusion and deception in the hearts of those that are outside of Christ. Every person is a religious person. Because you need faith to believe in God. You need faith to believe in alternative ideas of God. It's still faith. It's misplaced faith. But it's still faith. And you need faith to believe in no God. If you don't believe in God, your faith is greater than my faith. Because you believe that nothing exploded and created everything. For no reason. That everything is held together for no reason. That things are just perfectly in synchronization for no reason. It was just sheer luck, sheer chance that it all happened that way. I tell you, that takes some incredible faith. That's greater faith than I have. Where I believe in a God who is able to do all things. A God who only had to speak into nothing. And speak everything into existence. Because my God is a limitless God. Everyone is religious. The Catholic is religious in their sacraments. The Muslim is religious in following the five pillars of Islam. The Hindu is religious as regards their belief in karma. The Buddhist is religious in their pantheism that everything is God and God is everything. The atheist is religious in their so-called rationalism or humanism. The agnostic is religious in their skepticism. The ecumenist is religious about their syncretism, the all roads lead to heaven philosophy. And the religious Protestant is religious about their church going and their Protestant culture. And none of them are saved without Christ. Religion without Christ is false religion. And those who are convinced by false religion will rather choose hell than surrender themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are living in a world where there is much counterfeit religion. 
And that's a sign, according to the Lord Jesus, that we're approaching the end. But we're also living in a world where there's great evangelistic outreach. In verse 10, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. Now that will only be fulfilled finally during the tribulation period. When 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe, young men, will be sent out into all the world. They'll be sealed by God and they'll be sent out into all the world. They will reach the whole world for Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But we're making inroads in that. In 1900, beginning of the, sorry, well, end of the 19th century. You can argue about that one later as well if you want. End of the 19th century, it's estimated there were 100,000 missionaries in the world. Last year, it was estimated there were over 700,000 missionaries in the world. According to a 2015 study by Operation World, the following countries have the fastest growing evangelical movements in the world. I'm not talking about nominal Christianity. I'm talking about evangelical gospel believing and gospel preaching Christianity. Iran. The number of evangelical Christians has grown rapidly in recent years despite the country's strict Islamic laws. China has the largest population of Christians in the world. And the number of evangelical Christians is growing rapidly. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa. And again, the number of evangelical Christians is rising. Indonesia, the most populous Muslim country in the world, has a huge number of evangelical Christians. And South Korea has a long history of Christianity, especially nominal Christianity, but evangelical Christians are growing at a rapid rate. We're living in an exciting time. People are getting saved. And we may not be seeing much of it. But if we take the world globally, people are getting saved by the thousands. Praise the Lord. That there are still people getting saved. There are still missionaries preaching the gospel. But it seems like the Western church has taken its foot off the pedal as far as missionary endeavor is concerned. When was the last time that we sent out a flux of missionaries to the mission field? It's been a long time since we had a rapid growth in missionary endeavor from this country. And we have led that missionary endeavor for so many years. But we're slacking it now at the minute. But this is another sign that we're in the end times. But alongside this counterfeit religion and this evangelical outreach, there is anti-Christian rebellion. Verses 12 and 13. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death and the father the son and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. Now again remember we're talking about the seven years of tribulation but there's a little bit of back leakage into the time we're living in now and there is already anti-Christian Uh, thought and anti-Christian activity taking place, especially in the West. Biblical Christian theology is the most hated position for anyone to hold these days. Even within evangelical Christian denominations, there is opposition to the biblical worldview. A minister in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland set up a communion table. He's a bit of a renegade amongst them. But he set up a communion table for LGBT plus people who continue to hold on to their ungodly lifestyle to take part in it. And worse, they claim that Jesus would accept them just as they are. Well, he will accept them just as they are, but he will expect them to change, to be converted. We're not afraid to use that word. Even though our government would love to adopt that as a sign of of, uh, a violation of human rights. Sinners need converted. All sinners. Not just these people that we're talking about. We're talking about religious people. We're talking about irreligious people. All sinners need to be converted, need to be saved. If you believe there's only one way to salvation, 
Not through religion, not through a church, not through decency and good works, not through balancing out your life between the good and the bad, but only through repentance from sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are part of a hated minority. If you insist that there are objective and unchanging standards of morality, you are part of that minority. If you have a settled and steadfast conviction of doctrinal truth that is based upon the word of God alone and not on the teachings of a church or a preacher or an author, you are part of that minority. If you believe there really is a difference between biblical Christianity and all other religions, you are part of that minority. And that minority is hated today. It's made me angry this week. I trust that it's a righteous anger. When I see parades and mobs in the UK and other Western countries supporting Hamas on the streets of our country, including outside the Israeli embassy, yet to the best of my knowledge, no one has even been arrested for incitement to violence in support of terrorism. None of them are facing jail time. They've been chanting out from the river to the sea, which is a popular chant amongst those who want to expel and kill and destroy the Jewish people. And still nobody's been arrested. And yet, a group of believers can stand silently within an exclusion zone outside an abortion clinic in Northern Ireland and not only be arrested, but be fined or potentially jailed for praying that innocent unborn children would be saved from murder. Those trying to save lives will be prosecuted. Those calling for death, and especially the death of God's earthly people, are scot-free. This world is anti-Christian. Even in countries that have been founded upon Christian principles. But the rebellion against true Christianity is global. It's even in the homeland of the Christian faith, the land of Israel. In Israel recently, there was a huge push against evangelical Christians, including against Messianic Jews, from having an event in Jerusalem uh, that coincided with Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. A week and a half ago, a 75-year-old American citizen was was denied the right to make aliyah, That is to emigrate to Israel, even though his parents were in the concentration camps in Europe during the Holocaust. He was denied the right to emigrate simply because he is a Messianic Jew, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the coalition in Israel has said they want to change the law of return to prevent non-Orthodox Jews from returning to the land of Israel. Anti-Christian rebellion. But fourthly, there's Israel's rebirth. And this is one of the most exciting. Look at verse 28. Sorry, verse uh, verse 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. On the 14th of May, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared Israel to be an independent state. Eleven minutes later, President Harry Truman called Ben-Gurion to congratulate the Jewish people. The state of Israel is a modern miracle because despite being sent out into the world in 135 AD, despite being sent out and scattered throughout the whole world, they came back in 1948. They had maintained their identity as Jews. They had maintained their language, the language of Hebrew. They had maintained their religion, Judaism. They maintained their culture and all that comes along with being Jewish. They maintained their land. You know that ever since the scattering of the Jews in 135 AD, no other people, not one group of people, have ever led national claim to the land of Israel. The Palestinians as a people group never existed. 
until after the 14th of May 1948 when the Arabs moved in in vast numbers to try to push the Jews out of their land. See in your Bibles, in the map section, score out every time it says Palestine. Palestine didn't exist until at least 135 AD, when Emperor Hadrian renamed the land in defiance of the Jewish people to Syria, Palestina. The division of Palestine between the 12 tribes. No, it wasn't. It was the division of Israel between the 12 tribes. Palestine in the time of Jesus. No, it wasn't. It was Israel in the time of Jesus. The Jews are the original Palestinians. They have maintained their existence despite being invaded one day after the formation of the nation of Israel. In Isaiah 43, in verse 5, it says, Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, Keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. In chapter 66, it says, Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. On the 13th of May, 1948, there was no nation of Israel. On the 14th of May, 98, or 48, there was. In one day, a nation was born. Now, that was 75 years ago, but why is that important? This parable of the fig tree is referring to the nation of Israel, national Israel. Israel is a sovereign nation. And Jesus is talking about its rebirth when the branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. And that the generation that witnesses that rebirth will not pass until all the signs of the second coming are fulfilled. That will take place during the tribulation period. So the question is then, how long is a generation? Well, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, the Lord said that man's day shall be 120 years. In Psalm 90, it says the days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, Yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So 80 to 100 years, sorry, 80 to 120 years is the lifespan that we can expect. But look at when the children of Israel refused to enter the land. And they listened to the 10 unfaithful spies and Moses had to intervene with the Lord. The Lord said to the people in Numbers 14 and verse 29, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So all those 20 years old and upwards would die in the wilderness. And then in Numbers 32, 13, it says, The Lord's anger was, consil- was, sorry, was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. That generation began at 20 years old. There's another 60 to 100 years to make that up to 80 to 100 years old. So 60 to 100 years is a generation. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Keep those numbers in your head now. 60 to 100 years. How old is the new nation of Israel? 75 years. We're already 15 years into it. It includes the seven years of tribulation. So the rapture fits in sometime within a 53 to 93 year period since the rebirth of Israel in 1948. That means that at the higher end, we have no more than 18 years until the rapture at the most. 
If that is in any way accurate, I'm never going to collect my pension. All that money that I've put into it, I'm never going to collect it. Because I'll be gone. I'm not going to reach 67 years old. Connected with the rebirth of Israel is the fact that the nation is now in a position to experience the restarting of God's prophetic clock very soon. There are no events that need to happen before the rapture of the church, but there's one event that might happen, or at least might get started before the rapture. We'll not turn to it for the sake of time, but if you were to look at Ezekiel 38 and read through that chapter, I know it's a terrifying book, it terrifies me. But if you look at chapter 38, there are places mentioned in it. We have Gog, who is the leader of Magog. Magog is Russia. It talks about Meshach and Tubal. Meshach is southern Russia and down into the South Caucasus, which is Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Tubal is northern Turkey. It speaks of Persia and Ethiopia and Libya. Persia is Iran. Ethiopia, or Kush as it is often in the Old Testament, is actually not Ethiopia today, but Sudan today. Libya is still Libya. Gomer, this is an interesting one, is Ukraine. Togarma is southern Turkey and possibly northern Syria. And these countries are going to move against Israel. Sheba and Dedan are mentioned. They're part of Saudi Arabia. They will condemn this anti-Israel alliance, but they won't interfere. And God will be, bring destruction upon this axis of evil supernaturally with a strong earthquake by causing them to turn on each other through disease, possibly one that causes excessive bleeding, through flooding caused by excessive rain, through hailstones and fire and brimstone. And it will be evident that these are all caused by God. Now, folks, the current war between Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah is not the battle of Ezekiel 38. It's not the Gog and Magog battle. But it could very easily become the battle of Ezekiel 38. And this is a battle that will take place immediately before the tribulation period. Russia and Iran have more than likely, it's almost certain that they have supplied equipment and weapons and intelligence and training. Turkey and Syria have not only condemned Israel, they are now, well, Syria is now involved with shooting rockets into Israel. Ukraine and the South Caucasus are being overwhelmed by Russia. I think it's likely that Ukraine is going to lose their war. Russia is already in Georgia. It has already got people working within Armenia and Azerbaijan. Libya and Sudan, one month ago, Putin met with the leaders of Libya and Sudan in one day. World events that we are watching on our TV screens, and especially those involving Israel, are coming closer and closer to these prophecies that we find in the Word of God. We're not surprised because God will always keep his word. You see how close we're getting? I can honestly say on the Saturday whenever we heard that Hamas had massacred so many Israeli people, I honestly thought to myself, Jesus could come back tonight. I had a sense of feeling of just how close the return of the Lord Jesus for his own people is. Folks, we are right on the threshold. We are that close. He could come back tonight and I wouldn't be surprised. You see, the Bible says we don't know the day or the hour. It says nothing about the week, month or year. Daniel understood through the writings of Jeremiah that 70 years would be completed before the Judah, people of Judah would be let out of the land of Babylon. From the scriptures, he understood the times. The tribe of Naphtali understood the signs of the times. Do we? 
The final sign is the approaching rapture. We can see these things happen. We are told in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. We are told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, but the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the, trump of God, with, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And after that rapture, there will be the wrath of God. In Revelation 6, the seal judgments are poured out upon the world. Conquest, violence, war, famine, death, martyrdom, natural disasters. Folks, already creation is groaning. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 8. For the creature, or creation, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, corruption came upon all creation. And creation is groaning. Creation is waiting for that redemption whenever we are caught up to be with the Lord. And creation knows then that there's only seven years until Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom where everything will be put right again. And creation is groaning. Do you know how we know? Because diseases are on the increase. Medical conditions and syndromes are on the increase. Why do we have so many who have autism and Alzheimer's and dementia and cancer, especially uh, very malignant and fast-moving cancers? Why do we have so many of it today? Folks, it's not just because we have better ways of detecting it. It's because creation is groaning. That's why there's so much sickness in the world. Creation's getting tired of its corruption. Earthquakes, there are more extreme earthquakes in unusual places, diverse places, unusual places. Extreme weather, wildfires. Folks, it's got absolutely nothing to do with man-made climate change. Creation is groaning. Folks, time is running out. Bring these five things together. Counterfeit religion, evangelistic outreach, Anti-Christian rebellion, Israel's rebirth, approaching rapture. We may argue that one of these things is just coincidence, or maybe two of them, but all five? In Matthew 24, 44, the Lord said, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. We can almost hear the Savior's breath drawing in before he sends out our call to meet him in the sky. But it's a call only the saved we're going to hear. For any that aren't saved, what awaits them is the most intense and destructive and fatal days that this planet has ever known. Half of the world's population will die from the judgments of God alone. Many more will die when evil is let loose to do what it wants to do in this world. And that's only the beginning. Dear friend, if you're not saved, you're running out of time. You don't have time to wait to see what you can get out of this life. You don't have time to wait and see if you can reach retirement and some kind of a rest. You don't have time to wait and think these things over too much. It's a very simple truth. You're lost. You're an enemy of God but simply because you're born a sinner. But God, who is your enemy, wants to be your savior. 
And he loves you and he sent Jesus Christ to die for you so that you could be delivered from the wrath to come. That's why I'm trying to paint this frightening picture of what's to come. I'm not doing it deliberately, but it's a frightening picture simply because it's true. These things are going to happen. And if you realize the truth of that and if you confess and admit that you're one of those sinners and that you need to be saved and you believe with all of your heart that only Jesus Christ can save you, then cry out for his mercy and his forgiveness. Cry out for him to cleanse you from your sin and to make you ready for heaven. Then you'll be saved and you'll never have to face the wrath of God. And although we're running out of time, and I know my time is gone, You can make sure tonight that whenever that time does run out, you'll be ready to leave behind the horrors of this world. You'll be ready to enjoy the glory and the joy and the peace of heaven. Will you come to him? Will you trust him while there's still time? Trust that you will. Let's just sing, please, the first and last verse of our closing hymn. O sinner, the Savior is calling for thee. Long, long has he called thee in vain. He called thee when joy lent its crown to thy days. He called thee in sorrow and pain. First and last verse, please. Father, we thank you indeed for thy long suffering and thy patience, because you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But Father, thy patience is going to run out someday. And there's an hour that has been set, and we don't know the day nor the hour, but we can see the impending signs of the coming again of the Lord. And the time is coming very near when all those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ will be taken out of this world and those who haven't believed in him will be left behind to face and suffer the wrath of the Almighty. But Father, we thank you that we're still in the day of grace. We thank you, Father, that you're still calling sinners to repentance and faith. And we pray, Lord, that before it's forever too late, before these signs turn into actual events prophesied in Scripture. Heavenly Father, we pray that they would repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Lord, thank you for those of us that are saved, that we have no fear of the wrath of God, either in this world or in eternity. But we know that it's well with our soul and help us to rejoice in that truth this evening. Bless us now, Lord, as we would separate. Take us to our homes in safety, we pray. In our Savior's precious name.